And so Moses went up the mountain to receive the law. And the law was delivered. You shall have no other gods. Make no idols. Observe the Sabbath. Rabbi Samuel Holdheim, one of the Talmudic scholars in the early 1800s, which began the reform movement, looking at the loss of peoplehood amongst his fellow Jews, and in an effort to preserve the Sabbath, proposed moving the Sabbath to another day of the week. He writes, All our efforts to, for the restoration of a dignified Sabbath observance are in vain, and unfortunately there is no radical means to settle the conflict between Sabbath celebration and the demands of civic life other than changing the former to some other occupationally unencumbered day. I protest against any concession which seems thereby to have, made, have been made to Christian principles. I have in mind only the possibility of a dignified Sabbath celebration. The wounds from which our religious life suffer cuts deep into all our hearts, and helplessness will be the mark of all our endeavors until the time comes when the only possible cure for the disease will have been prescribed. We wish to save the Sabbath for Judaism, and to save Judaism through the Sabbath, even if we have to give up its symbolic framework. According to a Midrash, Avot Rabbi Natan, Moses took the tablets of the commandments and started descending the mountain, happy and excited. And on these tablets, the guarding of Shabbat. Vishamru b'nei Israel hat Shabbat. The people of Israel are to guard the day of rest, a day of personal reflection, and a day to remember, Zachor, to celebrate a day thanking God for creation. And the benefits of observing the Shabbat are not just for our own personal benefit. According to tradition, if the Jewish people were only to observe two Shabbatot, the Messiah would already have come. The Jerusalem Talmud actually disagrees with the Babylonian Talmud on this point, saying just one Shabbat, just one Shabbat of observance amongst the whole Jewish people will bring the Messianic era. Commentators struggling with this disagreement read it thus. If we are able to achieve one Shabbat as a people, then the rest will be much closer to being routine. Avot to Rabbi Natan continues. Moses took the tablets of the commandments and started descending the mountain happy and excited. But then he looked down. And when he saw the offense the Israelites had committed in building the golden calf, he asked himself, how can I give them these ta tablets of the commandments? In doing so, I would be obligating them to these laws and thus condemning them to death. For it says, you shall have no other gods before me. And in this moment, all seems lost for Moses and for the Jewish people. If this is where the Midrash ended, and if this is where the story ended, there would be no Jewish people today. And if it weren't so horrific, the book would in some way seem complete. Moses comes down with the tablets that say no other gods, and there's gods, and the rest continues. The sin of the golden calf has been blamed for much in Jewish history, but the sin of the golden calf has also allowed for the blessings of the worlds we have it today, of the next set of tablets written in partnership with God, of the oral Torah and the legends of our fathers. But here we are at this moment of sin, with Moses' good mood rapidly disappearing, two tablets in hand, looking out at the scene in front of him, and then the realization hits him. If he takes another step forward, if the people get a peek of what's written on these tablets and thus have knowledge of the commandments and God's will, then with that step, he is condemning them to death. And so our Midrash continues. Moses started to turn back. But the elders saw him and ran after him. For we are eager for a Jewish life, a life full of what is good and what is right. Even in the midst of worshiping the golden calf, the elders are eager for God's words, for instruction as to what it is to be Jewish, to celebrate the God which led them out of Egypt. 
and a petition in 1897 in Berlin by members of the communities of the city's Jewish community looking for the community to establish a Sunday Shabbat service. They sent out 22,000 petitions to various families in the community. They report that 2,200 were returned as undeliverable, 1,200 families opposed a Sunday Sabbath service, and 5,800 families expressed themselves in favor of this idea. In this petition, they argue that a Sunday Sabbath service is the only way to preserve Judaism. Those for whom the service is to be instituted, they write, are precisely whose members of our community who, with the exception of a few days, never hear anything of Judaism throughout the year and know nothing of it. Those who, through unavoidable duties, are prevented from going to the synagogue on Saturday shall be given the opportunity, through the Sunday service, to be reminded that they are Jews and are to be reminded of their Jewishness and the significance of Judaism. It is precisely our purpose that the religious sentiment should not die within them and their children as is otherwise so predominantly the case. They should be acquainted with the wonderful beauty of their religion. They should pray one day a week in the assembled congregation to the God who is ever the rock and guardian of Israel. Moses started to turn back, but the elders saw him and ran after him. Moses held on to one side of the tablets, and they held on to the other. But Moses was stronger. He looked down at the tablets and noticed that the writing had disappeared from them. How can I give the Israelites blank tablets, he thought, and decided it would be better to break them instead. As it is said, I took hold of the two tablets and cast them out of my two hands and broke them. Now, the truly remarkable part of this midrash, taught me by Rabbi Adina Levitas, the first female assistant dean of the conservative seminary, is not about what Moses does here, but about what God does. Moses decided to withdraw from the commandments, to withdraw the commandments, to save the lives of the people he was about to condemn to death by their delivery. And God went with it and did one better. Moses, looking at the tablets the moment before shattering them, saw that God had agreed with his decision to spare the people. A theme that is maintained in the rest of our Torah portion. Rabbi Levitas teaches that what Moses understood was that there could be no Torah without a community to follow its teachings. And if the community was not present, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, to receive the Torah, better the Torah be withdrawn than have all its potential adherence destroyed and God agreed. She writes that this is a powerful lesson for Judaism today, in particular for those of us committed to the renewal of Jewish life in the 21st century. We stretch ourselves to respond to the growing majority of Jews who no longer deem binding the traditional interpretations and practices of the Torah. We create innovative educational programs, write radically new commentaries, promote new theologies, expand accessibility to life cycle rituals, and even redefine Jewish identity, all in the hopes of re-engaging the people to whom this sacred legacy was given and on whose shoulders its destiny rests. She continues, and yet our attempts are often met with criticisms of diluting, dumbing down, making convenient, compromising and sacrificing our Torah's teachings in an effort to engage people who don't take it to heart. Only the precious few living a traditional form of Judaism, usually defined by adherence to a set of practices grouped under the heading of religious observance, which in common parlance is too often equated with orthodoxy, only they seem to be able to claim the title of authentic Jews. What is lost in these arguments, she teaches, is the profound message of the Midrash, that there is no value in Torah for Torah's sake. In fact, such thinking can prove terribly destructive. The Torah's value derives from those who animate its teachings by living them. And according to our striking Midrash, when God accedes to Moses' impulse to withdraw the laws and smash the tablets, God embraces the idea of the primacy of the people, however imperfect we may be, over the supposedly perfect Torah. Now, 
to assure Rabbi Splansky and Rabbi Appleby, I'm not advocating for Sunday Shabbat services here at Holy Blossom Temple. Many of you know that nearly 100 years ago, our synagogue did have a, its better attended service on Sunday. And I hope this isn't going to get Rabbi Appleby in trouble, but if any of you would like to attend a Sunday service, Rabbi Appleby will be there for you at 9 o'clock uh, tomorrow morning, of course, in a service led by one of our lay leaders in the Herman Chapel. And if you want to come Monday at 7.30... Nine, nine, nine this week, because it's family, right, because on holidays it's nine. Um, on family day at nine o'clock, I'll be there, and on Tuesday, Rabbi Splansky will be there, etc., etc., because we do, of course, have our weekday services, both morning and evening, um, here at Holy Blossom Temple. But these services are not Shabbat services, of course. It's easy for us to look at this time, this period in Reformed Jewish history, and to laugh and be critical of it. They were destroying Judaism by moving the Sabbath to a Sunday. Our colleagues in America are degrading Judaism through intermarriage. The early reformers set us up to ridicule by moving the ark away from the east to face the west. But this... Right? <laughs> but this is the work of people trying to create a Judaism that works living in a world without a plain, clear answer. And Moses, their teacher, coming down the mount, had one answer. But God, seeing that this law would result in no more Jews, withdrew it. Earlier, I glossed over what happened next, but it's important. Moses, realizing that he is about to hand the people a blank slate, destroys it instead of going up for more content. So he can go up for more content. None of the reformers I quoted wanted to get rid of Shabbat. All of them said it is crucial for the survival of the Jewish people. The fight is over how best to observe Shabbat so that it remains a day of rest and a day of giving praise over the wonder of creation. We no longer even dwell on the thought of a Sunday Sabbath, Yet how many families did that tradition keep in the Jewish fold? How many of our grandparents sent our parents to Sunday school while they themselves attended services? And those blank tablets, the broken tablets, our tradition tells us remain in the Ark of the Covenant next to the complete set which God and Moses created together. Rabbi Lavitas, also the first Canadian female conservative rabbi, asks... Will the tablets I hold in my hand survive the collision of our culture today and emerge recast into a Torah of authentic Judaism for the future that is unfolding before us? Will the record of the sacrifices we make today take their place in the Holy Ark along the ongoing sacred narrative of the Jewish people? Like the tug of war our opening midrash describes between the elders and Moses over the tablets of the law, our Torah today is wrenched between the weight of the past and the call of the future, which will lead to its salvation, a tighter embrace or a looser grip. We must be willing to find out. We, searched, we seek to preserve tradition through innovation. How do you innovate on Shabbat to observe Shabbat? For, as our tradition says, one Shabbat observed by all the Jews in the world paves the way for a world that is eternally Shabbat. May we, as a people, engage in the struggle to achieve a Shabbat of wholeness, a Shabbat Shalom.